Hello, everybody, and welcome to my virtual session. Uh, my name is Todd Golding, and I'm a partner solutions architect at AWS. Uh, and I am part of a team that's called the SaaS Factory. And that team basically works with organizations that are building or modernizing or optimizing um, SaaS solutions uh, on the AWS stack. And uh, obviously, as part of that effort, uh, we get very much into the weeds of what it means to sort of design and architect SaaS solutions. Uh, and what I really wanted to do when I brought this session together was just say, what can I do to sort of sort of capture and bring together uh, a lot of the moving parts that are sort of fundamental to building a, a solid SaaS architecture and SaaS design. Now, in this compressed format, we certainly won't be able to dig into the weeds uh, as much as uh, we might normally do. And I certainly would encourage you to go look at some of the other content that we have out there. But hopefully, at least from here, we'll sort of build a foundation of, of concepts and building blocks that would really give somebody who's sort of trying to get themselves into the fundamentals of SaaS architecture and design a, a good foundation of knowledge uh, that will really help you as you then move on into the deeper concepts. So uh, as we launch into this and we start to look at, you know, what are we going to cover in this topic? What we're really going to do here is sort of start at the outside and work our way in and sort of walk end to end through this experience. Uh, so what I've done here as a starting point is try to create uh, some view of what I think the sort of high level landscape of a SaaS architecture looks like uh, and really call out some of those core building blocks and knowing that we're maybe oversimplifying a little bit here. But fundamentally, right, we, as a SaaS environment, we're gonna start with some tenants. Uh, we're ultimately here trying to build a multi-tenant solution. And one of the first things that you have to think about, and people often overlook this, is just how will a tenant get introduced into your environment? How will they get onboarded? How will their infrastructure get configured? How will they sign up? How will they uh, select a tier that they wanna be part of? All of those moving parts that need to be fully automated so that a tenant can sign up and become part of your system. And now some people will say, well, that's only a B2C kind of experience uh, and that's where consumers are signing up with credit cards. Now, even in B2B environments, there needs to be a fully frictionless onboarding experience, even if this onboarding experience uh, is run by an internal team. Uh, the other piece of this is authentication, right? We have to think about how we're going to associate these tenants uh, with some notion of an identity and associate them with a tenant and how are we going to bind all that together and flow it through the system so that as we interact with the moving parts of the system we're essentially going to be um, have that tenant context that we need always at our fingertips um, now the next sort of phase of this and this is the piece most people tend to want to focus on is the actual application services. This is where the microservices of our architecture are, or if it's a monolith, these might be much more coarse-grained concepts. But either way, this is kind of where the business functionality lives. And a lot of people, as they're thinking about uh, architecting and designing for multi-tenancy, they want to focus here. But the reality is our goal, will, as you'll see, is to actually make it so that writing these services, uh, if we're doing it well, won't have to think an awful lot about multi-tenancy. Um, and of course, the next piece we'll have to look at is storage, right? We now have multiple tenants in this environment. How do we represent these tenants? How do we represent their data? And uh, how do we isolate that data and all those other bits, right? And then the piece that sort of gets lost in this a lot of times in the SaaS universe is this notion of tenant isolation, right? We all know that we want tenants to be isolated, but what do we actually do with the architecture and the design of our systems to make sure that we don't have tenants that cross boundaries. And especially because there's so many different ways we can build a SaaS solution, what are the tools and uh, sort of techniques we can use to keep one tenant from accessing another tenant? Finally, um, the area that we won't get to touch on in this format, but is super important, is all these other bits that sort of surround your system uh, to create a great operational and uh, sort of DevOps and uh, management sort of experience. So. You know, how are you going to collect metrics out of this environment so that you have a view into what's going on and really know like what tenants are doing, how they're consuming resources in your system, fundamental to a really good SaaS system. Uh, how are you gonna operate this system? How are you gonna know when tenants are healthy or unhealthy and how are you able to troubleshoot it? Uh, and how are you gonna build for consumption in here, right? So as we move to SaaS, we tend to moving to more of a consumption-based model. Uh, what do we do in here uh, to sort of track and meter that consumption and turn that into a bill.
But this is the high level sort of view uh, and this sort of sets the table uh, for the rest of the pieces that we'll look at. Okay, so where we've got the landscape figured out, now let's look at what it would mean to actually introduce a new tenant into this environment. How would we onboard them uh, and create everything that's needed to set up a new tenant in our environment? And this can actually be a pretty involved process. And it's super important to get this part of your design and your architecture nailed down and have it be a very repeatable, very testable part of your, your design. Uh, now what I've got here are some microservices that are a example of a, of a registration service. Certainly yours could look different. But in this case, I've introduced a microservice, it's tenant registration. Um, we'll hit that, we'll provide the basic context of our tenant, their tier, those kinds of, that kind of information you'd provide uh, at, at signup, even if it's internal or external. And then this service will go out to a user management service to say, hey, we've got to introduce uh, the user into the system because not only are we provisioning a tenant, we're provisioning a user in that tenant, that's the initial admin user. And then that user will go out to whatever identity provider there is, uh, establish this and uh, here I've uh, called out an open ID connect provider because this is really commonly used in SaaS environments and good for federated identity and so on and in that environment we'll create the admin user and we'll also set up any custom claims if you're not familiar with open ID connect uh, really lets you give uh, these custom attributes to your identity so here's where we'll connect to the tenant context and the tenant identity to our our admin users identity and then we'll also set up any access policy. So whatever our tenant isolation story is, however we're going to separate one tenant from another, uh, this is the moment at which we would actually go provision and configure any of those uh, policies. And then uh, finally, we'll actually go to the tenant service here, uh, which is an entirely standalone service and say, let's create that new tenant. So set them up with a tenant ID, the plan, status. And the key thing here is in your SaaS architecture is that you want to manage the tenant entirely independently from the rest of the things that might be connected to the tenant because it, it has a life cycle of its own. And then finally, um, you're likely to be billing somehow for this system. You may actually have to go provision a relationship with a billing service to say, uh, create an account. And usually these billing, these billing providers can be external. So you may have some async interaction here where you'll go out and create the billing. Now, the piece I've left out of this is um, you could actually actually be provisioning uh, infrastructure as part of this experience as well if each tenant is somehow getting uh, infrastructure that uniquely belongs to them. Once we have this identity established and we have these uh, this fundamental sort of provision for our tenant, um, now we can use that tenant context and flow it through every bit of our experience. So if we look at a tenant and they come into our system, they hit the identity provider now because they've been created and they authenticate. Uh, and now they flow into some microservice. Kind of oversimplified a little bit here. But the key thing here is now when I authenticate and I get that uh, token back from the identity provider, it's what I would call a SaaS token. It has both the user's identity and this tenant context in it. And now when I flow that into that, uh, my, my microservice, that microservice can actually use that token and without having to leave the microservice to go get any extra context uh, or create any extra latency or bottleneck with some centralized service that might get us tenant identity. And this carries through now as I go to talk to the database or I go interact with the database, you'll see that, um, that, I, that token follows me and it controls and scopes my access to resources. Or if I cross a boundary to another microservice, um, that context will follow me, flow into that service and flow into that microservices interaction with other resources. So this is a really pivotal concept to any good SaaS design, which is to say, we want the front of our authentication process to inject these tokens, flow them through and have them be at the fingertips of all the microservices uh, and mechanisms we have as they try to touch resources. Now, where we really start to see this notion of, of uh, tenant identity and context pay off is when we get into the actual microservices of our SaaS architecture. So when we get here into the microservices, the natural question everybody asks is like, um, I've built this really rich uh, sort of modern microservices architecture. What do I have to do to it to make it multi-tenant aware? And the interesting part of that is uh, that our goal really is to say, 
um, whatever is involved in making a, a service multi-tenant uh, aware um, should be pushed out and away from the view of developers. So in reality, what we'd like is a scenario where building a multi-tenant microservice is no more difficult than building a single tenant microservice. And the way we achieve that is by sort of using this context that flows into us about the tenant and then pushing it out uh, to layers that surround uh, our multi-tenant microservice and hide away the details of multi-tenancy. So if we looked at an example and we had an application microservice uh, and that microservice had uh, the context of tenant identity flowing into it in a token. Now when that microservice goes to access data, we're just going to have a data access layer, traditional sort of library, module, whatever language sort of construct you have here, that is our data access layer. But we're going to push all the tenant awareness and knowledge out to that data access layer. So in this example, in fact, I have orders which are, uh, are partitioned uh, here uh, into two separate databases where each tenant has its own database. And then I have products here uh, where the tenancy is actually shared in a single database. And what I've done here is said, uh, from the microservice developer's perspective, they just ask for orders or they just ask for products. They flow through that context uh, of the token and the data access layer then figures out uh, how and where do I go get that data. Uh, and then that same model applies as we look at authorization on the way into the service. So we'll, whatever sort of context in that token is gonna be used to authorize your ability to execute this microservice will be applied there. And then we'll even see this in logging. A lot of people think, well, we just have logging. We'll just log from a microservice like we normally would. However, in a multi-tenant environment, we have to log with tenant context. Uh, and we have to in inject that tenant ID into all of our log statements so that when we're troubleshooting, we can look at these logs through the lens of individual tenants. And so here, again, we'll take that token and we'll have our logging sort of library, look at that token and inject that tenant context for us. And then the last piece of this is, is the notion of metrics. And this may be sort of an area you're just not touching now, but what we find is in multi-tenant environments, we really need rich data about what's going on inside of these environments and we need it with tenant context. So as we start to publish metrics about how tenants are consuming resources and which aspects of this microservice they're using and so on, we wanna publish those metrics and then have this metrics library inject that tenant context uh, and have it uh, available to us so that we can do analytics and other bits downstream. Uh, data uh, in multi-tenant environments is sort of interesting because on the surface it seems uh, like a pretty basic concept. Uh, but what you find today is there's so many different ways to represent data, blobs or file storage or um, NoSQL or relational databases or search engines or um, Hadoop or some other mechanism. And the question across all those is, like, how do I actually store and represent multi-tenant data? And what are the right ways to sort of partition that data? Uh, and there, the basic options are, are pretty straightforward, right? Um, um, no matter which one of those mechanisms you're using, um, the real question is, um, how commingled is the data going to be? Uh, so you may, for example, have this order microservice, and in this order microservice, I have what's called a pooled model, where all the data is stored in some common database construct uh, and is indexed by individual tenant. And the way that I sort of uh, access data is based on this key or index. Uh, another model here would be, hey, uh, one where we would say, you know what, we don't want that data commingled, and there's a number of reasons may, we may not want it commingled. And so we may use what's called a silo model here, essentially, where each, uh, each tenant gets their own storage construct. Uh, and so where it gets more interesting is you say, whether I'm silo or whether I'm pool, um, um, how silo or pool lands on each one of the individual storage services can still be pretty tricky. So um, you wanna sort of take this basic idea and then figure out uh, how it overlays the different storage technologies you might be using. The other aspect of, of data partitioning that you have to think about is um, this is often a microservice by microservice based decision. So you're not deciding sort of globally, I'm pool or I'm siloed. I'm going to decide that for some uh, realms of data, um, silo may be a perfectly good model. For other realms, pool may be a, a great fit. And what we find is like compliance may push you a direction. So compliance may force you to be siloed for one realm of data. 
uh, a noisy neighbor and performance might uh, impose certain restrictions that would cause you to decompose differently. Um, there's a whole range of sort of considerations that need to be considered on a microservice by microservice based model. And I always encourage organizations to say, um, ask yourself what your partitioning strategy is in a much more granular way instead of approaching this as a, as a global construct. The last area we're going to look at here uh, is tenant isolation. And uh, this is one of the most fundamental, important aspects of building a really robust uh, multi-tenant SaaS solution. Uh, and the idea here is we have to introduce constructs that will ensure that one tenant can't somehow inadvertently access the resources of another tenant. If, if somehow a, a tenant's allowed to cross that boundary, um, that could be a huge event for a business uh, and have a huge impact on the perception of your product. Um, so we have to do everything we can. Now we're only going to touch on this uh, lightly here because we just don't have the time to dig in, but I encourage you to go look at the other materials we have on this area. But um, if we just look at the basic idea of isolation, um, there's really two sort of fundamental approaches. One which is the silo model where essentially we used really coarse grain constructs and we say every tenant gets their own environment basically. And so the sort of notion of isolation is that we put them in their own network construct uh, and they're very well isolated with well-known uh, uh, mechanisms that we can use. Um, or um, we have this notion of uh, pool-based isolation, which is to say, hey, these tenants are now all sharing these resources. Uh, and, we, and because they're sharing resources and they're all ex sort of side by side while they're running, um, we have to have some way in that environment to ensure isolation as well. Now, if we dig into this just a little bit more to see what I mean by this, uh, imagine we have this environment, we have three tenants, they're coming in, they're sharing these three microservices. They're all running in the same process space and executing in the same process space. Um, and now we need some notion of isolation in here. How do we do it? Uh, and the real challenge here is that uh, if these tenants are all running side by side, so I show three tenants running side by side here, and they're each reaching out and touching some data, uh, that's partitioned, how do I ensure that tenant one can't somehow uh, access the data of tenant two or cross a boundary to some other resource? Um, this is the fundamental challenge of pool-based isolation. So the basic approach to this is that you need some notion of a runtime scoped access, some way at runtime that you can say, go get some policies, some credentials that will control and scope my access to ensure that I don't cross a tenant boundary. And Got an example here of what this looks like. So imagine I go out and I say get products from some product manager microservice and pass in in the bearer token, the header of this, a JOT token. That JOT token has a tenant identifier in it and some role and some other bits. That's my tenant context. That goes out to the data access layer, says go get me products. And now this data access manager says, hey, I'm about to go touch a resource. Uh, I need context. Uh, for, for touching that resource to ensure that I don't cross a tenant boundary. So it goes out to this isolation token manager, says go get me scope credentials. It goes out to some tenant access manager you looked at, looks at the policies you've defined through whatever mechanism you're using, uh, and says essentially, hey, let me get the role uh, that's appropriate for this particular tenant. Um, pass the token back that corresponds to that role or the credentials that correspond to that role. Um, give that back to the data access manager. And now when that data access manager goes to get data, data, it will actually use these tenant scoped credentials. So you can implement this lots of different ways, but the fundamental idea here is before I go touch a resource, I'm gonna go out and I'm going to get credentials that are scoped by this particular tenant and use those credentials to access any resource as a way of trying to limit any cross-tenant access. So those are the basic building blocks of a, a SaaS architecture. Uh, I did want to leave you with like just a few key themes and a few reminders based on the topics we touched on here. Hopefully it's really clear that you need a, a, a really a robust and, and, and really well thought out identity and onboarding strategy. And hopefully you can see how that identity flowed through the whole experience and how uh, critical it was to really having good isolation, good partitioning, and all those other moving parts of your SaaS architecture. Um, also, we'll put a lot of emphasis on this need for uh, limiting the developer awareness of multi-tenancy. Uh, I use the sort of good design and architecture constructs that are available to you to sort of push uh, 
uh, the awareness of multi-tenancy out of the view uh, of your application developers. Um, and then this this notion of data partitioning and finding the right fit for uh, for your the for your data and and finding the right model for your data and doing that on a microservice by microservice basis I believe is is super important. Uh, and then tenant isolation, uh, you should see that tenant isolation is just fundamental to building a really good uh, SaaS solution. And what we don't want to do is somehow equate. Uh, tenant isolation to authentication and authorization. It's really another layer of sort of protection on top of those two. And then the last thing here is the bits we really couldn't touch on, right? Don't overlook metrics, operations, agility. These are like fundamental to building a really good SaaS product, but um, but we just really just in, in this format didn't have the time to sort of dig into those areas. I did want to at least highlight that um, if you're looking for more information, by all means, um, go out and hit the SAS Factory page at AWS and you'll get more of the depth on some of these topics we hit on. Uh, and if outside this context you need to reach me, certainly uh, feel free to hit my email address uh, that's listed here. Thank you so much.